Before we continue with the construction activities at the job site, I thought it would be a good idea to come inside and uh, join us at a progress meeting. That is me on the right hand side there, enjoying the meeting, enjoying the camaraderie with my colleagues. And it's a meeting I especially enjoy because we are of a common mind with a common purpose and that is to solve problems and keep the project moving. You do this by making sure that every participant in the project is sitting inside this room. So you have the designer, you have the owner, you have the contractor, there are representatives of the utility companies, and from time to time you might uh, invite other people to deal with specific issues. You need them all in the room and then the atmosphere is uh, rolling up your sleeves, identifying the problem, sketching out solutions, and working towards resolving the problem. Everyone has to be there and that way uh, no time is lost. You can't always uh, settle a problem inside this room but the designer typically has to go off and prepare some sketches, identify some options, and they'll be discussed at the next meeting. When the activities are, are busy and there are obvious uh, interferences and unforeseen conditions, it's productive and useful to have this meeting as often as once a week. When the project is less impacted by these problems and is in a kind of a groove, you might meet as infrequently as once a month. But I would say uh, more is better only because everyone is here with that common purpose of finding solutions. Now we're back at the job site we recently shifted traffic onto this newly completed area. The completed area consists of permanent pavement where you could place the permanent pavement and that was uh, augmented by temporary pavement in order to create this three-lane roadway. As soon as the traffic is shifted onto this new space, the space alongside of it becomes your new work zone. The first activity are always uh, utilities. That is, after you've removed the existing pavement, you begin pursuing utilities. In this view, you can see the installation of a gas main right down the center of this work zone. And with that trench open and the gas main installed, there's nothing else that can take place. Even if there are adjoining utilities, you really need to wait until, until this is done and backfilled before you can get at the next utility. I want to point out that gas mains present a particular problem because you can construct the new gas main, which is being done here. The intent is generally to activate the new one so that some existing gas main, which is conflicting with your construction can then be removed. The point I need to make is that during the winter you cannot take an existing gas main out of service. So depending on the timing you may find that even though you've installed a new one and it's uh, ready to go, it cannot be activated and the old one is still in place, still in conflict with some other element of the construction. So that's something that's unique to gas mains. It's something you really need to know. Here's a ground view of the gas main. Again, it's uh, the, the space is, is simply uh, inaccessible. It's taken up completely by this pipe. The pipe also has offshoots going to the left and to the right and they are aimed at previously constructed pipe or at future pipe, which will be built in a later stage. So this puzzle has uh, complex uh, layers. 
you could get the work done within this stage, but it still may not be possible to activate this. That may be deferred until some later stage. You can see it's a very three-dimensional problem. Or does that make it a four-dimensional problem when you introduce time? The utilities are always the critical path. They need a lot of effort during the design stage. And even then, you need to constantly innovate during the construction process. And the utility representatives need to be there assisting you at uh, every step. Well, in this view, the utilities have been installed and backfilled, and you are now spreading a sub-base prior to paving. The machine that does that is a road grader. It has this very long wheelbase, which uh, keeps it very stable, and it has a blade for distributing the material. The blade can be adjusted in any direction. It can be tilted. It can be rotated, raised and lowered, so that the blade can be set precisely and you get a high degree of control when you're spreading out this uh, sub-base. That avoids a lot of handwork and you can cover a large area very quickly. In this view they have already installed the uh, paving form and they are now spreading the popcorn layer. That's a four inch thick layer of fine aggregate with uh, just the small amount of cement. It's being uh, spread here and in the foreground there's a, a template which is made in order to uh, set the top of the popcorn exactly where it belongs. So that template would be 11 inches high to provide the 11 inch space for the concrete roadway. Now a similar template is made to strike off the subbase. You want to make sure that the uh, subbase is 15 inches uh, below the finished grade. And sometimes that template you might make just uh, 14 inches high and have nails projecting from the bottom of it. In that case, I'd call it a scratch board. And when you drag that along the edges of pavement, it will actually scratch the subbase where the subbase is high so that the laborers know exactly where they have to scrape it down. The presence of these uh, little handmade tools greatly facilitates the work. It's very low tech, but it produces the result that you're looking for. The popcorn layer gets compacted, but nevertheless, even with the compaction, it remains porous. And the goal is always to have a porous layer underneath the finished pavement. You never want water collecting there. That results in a kind of a pumping action on the uh, pavement. It's subjected to freezing and thawing. So the idea of continuously draining the water away from the underside of the pavement. That is the most desirable end product. And the popcorn has been found to be a very, very effective way to construct a porous subbase that remains porous over time. Here's a view of the saw cutting operation to construct the construction joints. Before the concrete pavement is placed, there are baskets of uh, dowels that are placed at about 15 foot intervals at the location of the construction joint. The concrete is then placed and the saw cut is made to force a crack, a controlled crack, at the location of the dowels or at the location of the construction joint. This has to be done rather quickly because the concrete wants to shrink as it cures. So on a hot day, you might place the concrete in the morning and then after lunch do the saw cutting. Uh, during the winter, it would probably be done the following morning. 
This looks like a hot day and this was probably done at the same day that the concrete was placed. The blade is a diamond tipped blade and it needs water. At the same time the water is very helpful because it controls any dust. And here's an edge view you can see that controlled crack has taken place exactly where the saw, saw cut was made. And you can see that the concrete shrinks. There's no question. It shrinks a measurable amount. And this might be only after the first few hours. And it continues to shrink over a lifetime, but at a much, much slower rate. So to avoid cracks in the concrete, you create these controlled cracks at regular intervals and the goal is that between the controlled cracks no further cracking will take place. After you saw cut the joint you create a kind of a groove, an opening and that needs to be sealed. So this photo shows the finished product. The joint has already been sealed and the controlled crack is uh, very evident. Here's a view from above showing the area that we've been uh, progressing. And in this view, the pavement is finished and placed in service. This is a nice view of the pedestrian crossing or the pedestrian walkway. When you place the pavement, you omit this area and you come back later. And in this case, it's filled in with uh, colored concrete to differentiate it from the adjoining pavement. So now southbound traffic and northbound traffic are on new pavement, which immediately opens the adjoining area to construct the next elements of the pavement. And the cycle will continue until all of the new pavement has been placed. Here is a summary. The upper slide is the beginning of this phase of construction and the lower slide shows this area being completed and placed in service. And approximately seven months have elapsed. So this is a longer duration than the first cycle of work and I believe in the second cycle there are two reasons for this. One is increased complexity of the utility work and the other is the fact that much of this work or at least uh, two or three months of this work took place during the winter. There are certain elements of construction that can be done very effectively through the winter but when you're doing this kind of surface work the winter has a tremendous impact. You, you need to really work in dry conditions and therefore during the winter the activities are somewhat limited. I think uh, taken together those two factors have slowed the progress of this second phase. But still under the circumstances and given the ongoing need to address problems uncovered at the site I think the progress is excellent. This concludes class one. Class two will remain at the same project, but there are variations in what's being done and it's worth having a look at those as well.